Well, good morning, everyone. I see that there's a whole bunch of comments already, so I'm gonna wait for people to get in a little bit more. Um, there's about a 20 second delay. I have my iPad right here set up so I can see the feed and how long it actually takes. It looks like about 20 seconds different. So um, I'm here, I got my tea, um, I've got my books just in case we need them. I also have the PDFs. So this is the regulation right here just for remote ID and this is the regulation right here for operations over people, operation at night and a whole bunch of other different things. So um, it's gonna be interesting. Um, I have the PDFs as well uh, available right here that we can go through. I have the slides that I use to do the presentation as well so I can refer to this. I see some of the questions in here already that I can, uh, that I can answer pretty quickly. And then at the end of the presentation today, um, uh, Vic Moss from the uh, Drone Service Provider Alliance. You've seen Vic in the past if you've been following us for a while. Um, Vic and Kenji built the, uh, the Drone Service Provider Alliance and, uh, and Vic had access to the regulation early from the FAA because of the DSPA and, uh, and he's put a lot of, of really good information out there. I know he's been really active on different forums so he's going to join us at the end of this video to answer some questions. He had a previous engagement before that uh, but also we'll have a full video with Vic and with Kenji uh, to talk about remote ID and, and the new regulation and uh, answer some additional questions. I know today I'm gonna get grilled on some questions that I can't answer and primarily because it's not in the regulation and, and I may not have access to some information but I know Kenji and Vic are closer to certain people in the industry and so they may have some questions. So I'm gonna write those down uh, if I can't answer them and, uh, and, then, and then we'll go from there. So I see there's a ton of people uh, already in here. So I'm gonna go up uh, the list and kind of try to answer your questions as we go. So keep them coming. I'm just gonna go down the list. Uh, what I can do is I can actually add the question onto the screen in itself and, um, and then we'll be uh, answering. I wanna make sure everything is good in here. I don't see anyone saying they can't hear me. Uh, we have people saying good morning from central Massachusetts, North Carolina. Uh, we have people from Miami. California. Oh, Bill. Hey, Bill. Uh, we have, I saw Don in here. Don, Decon FPV. Don is, uh, uh, does all of our FPV videos at, uh, at Pilot Institute. So if you've seen FPV videos, it's from Don. And then uh, get uh, Indiana. Awesome, get people from all over the place, love it. Love your comments, there was so, so much. Uh, I wake up every morning and then I go through the comments on that YouTube video and I try to answer them. And then uh, throughout the day, I just try to see and make sure that uh, your questions go answered pretty quickly. So I'm gonna start. Uh, Sapphire's phone right here was the first question that says, and I'm gonna put it up for you guys to see, which is right here. Uh, it says, with the module transmitting on the same frequencies as receivers use for home-built uh, UAS, I'm concerned about interference. Uh, does the FAA address this at all? And they don't. They don't actually have anything in here about interference, but remember that uh, modules and uh, remote ID aircraft are going to have to be approved by the FAA. Uh, the, um, the manufacturers are going to have to send paperwork to the FAA to tell them, hey, this is how we're going to do it, and, uh, and make sure that it works. So. I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that we won't see too much interference. Um, I know that a lot of UAS are working on the 2.4, 5.8 gigahertz uh, frequency spectrum, uh, but hopefully they can do something where that information doesn't interfere. Now this is, again, I'm not really an expert in this, but hopefully that's what it is. Um, all right, keep going in there. Chris is asking, uh, any estimate on how much a remote ID module will wait? No, I uh, haven't really seen anything, but with that being said, go to, um uh, now I'm going to have a brain fart. Uh, th there's a company in Europe, and I should know their name because I interviewed their CEO, who's a friend of mine, um, Unifly. Uh, it's early in the morning. Uh, Unifly has a, 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 d a dongle that they cell that they can put on the drone and it doesn't seem like it's that big of uh, a dongle so it should be able to fit on most drones uh, it shouldn't have too much shouldn't add too much weight to your drone uh, is what i'm thinking so that's what we have at this stage uh next question in here has the fa formally issued the start date of when the new regulation will take into effect uh steve steve has the question here so here's what i'm going to do steve uh i'm going to show you I'm gonna to switch to this right here. And um, uh, let me see here, I'm gonna remove, 
Let me just do something real quick here. You can see there's a green screen behind me and I want to actually swap that over if I can to something else. Nope. Okay. Well, that's fine. Uh, I'll just remove my face. You don't need to see me. Um, let's go back to this here. Uh, the question was about the timeline. And uh, here is, let me show you the timeline of when things are supposed to happen. Because I know this is a, a common question. So really, January of 2021 is uh, when the regulation just came out. So from here, we start the clock. At one point in January of 2021, there's going to be a, a publication of that regulation in the Federal Registry. And we don't know when that is yet. Let's just assume January 15, middle of January. Then 60 days later, middle of March, is when the regulation goes into effect. But, but the um, pilots won't have to comply until the end of September, okay? Uh, the, 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 until the middle of September uh, 2023. So if the regulation goes into effect in um, March, of uh, 2021, then it will be March 15, then it will be September 15 of 2023. That's when you have to comply. So 30 months after the effective date, which we don't know exactly what it is yet. Uh, the manufacturers have to comply 18 months after all that. So the manufacturers are gonna have to basically uh, make sure that they build drones that are compliant by the time uh, 18 months kicks in. So that puts us in uh, September of 2022 in this case. So Steve, I hope this answers your question right here. Um, let's go to the next one here. So this is yo, 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 uh, Bill, good morning. We have uh, Aiken drone flying. It says, thanks for doing this. And we really need to know about this stuff. Yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's changing. It, it's the biggest set of regulation that we've seen put in place since 2016 when the FAA came up with part 107. So. Uh, John is here from uh, Clarksville, Indiana. John and I, we've been exchanging messages about uh, how this is going to affect this police department. Uh, if you're a, uh, in a police department, let me know how you think this is going to affect you because I know uh, if you're doing search and rescue, uh, not search and rescue, if you're doing searches using the drone, um, then it's going to be, it's going to be tricky. Um, <laughs> Kakapupu H3 ADVIP is saying one thing that I have not heard, read, or seen is about the background check. Why and what uh, is it run for? Um, that's um, so that's something that was put in place with Part 107 a while back, and uh, it's a TSA background check, and and it kind of follows what the FAA does anytime they issue a pilot license on the manned aircraft side. Uh, this is something that people may not know, but there's always a background check being done. So this is something that they've added for consistency to to the um, uh, to the test to the uh, the the recruit. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm reading the the messages at the same time, and it's getting me confused. Um, and uh, it's something that was added to basically match when you get your remote pilot certificate. So uh, really what it is, it's just the TSA doing a quick background check to make sure that everything matches, that you're not gonna be uh, using drones for bad intents. Um, I don't know how I feel about it, but this is part of the system. Uh, the um, Obviously the bad guys are not gonna get the remote pilot certificate, but who knows. Uh, so this is something that if you're and flight training, doing flight training to be an airman, uh, an aircraft pilot, a man aircraft pilot, uh, you have, if you're a foreign student especially, you have to go through fingerprinting and you have to go through actually a lot of things that uh, people are not really aware of, but that, that's, that's, that's what it is. Uh, next question is from Bill. Bill said, uh, if there's time, will the remote ID module need to connect to the controller or just to the aircraft uh, concerned about distance? Now, that's a really good question, Bill. Um, my understanding so far is that the module will attach, it has to broadcast from the aircraft. That's part of the regulation. So it will more than likely be attached to the aircraft in itself. And then um, it will be a kind of a self-contained unit because it's gonna have sensors for speed, for altitude, for, uh, for GPS location. And the one thing that I'm not sure at this stage is how is it gonna work with the, um, 
the connection because it has to prevent the aircraft from taking off if it's not working correctly. So I don't know how, if there's going to be like kind of a, a kill switch, if you want, uh, to the drone if it's not working correctly. So that's the one part that I'm not entirely uh, clear on how that's actually going to work, uh, if it's going to be connected to the battery. I'm not sure. I, I, quite frankly, probably not to the battery. That wouldn't make sense, actually. So uh, that's the only thing. But in terms of the distance, um, the distance with your controller won't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really send any information. The module doesn't send information about the controller's location. It only sends information about the location from the takeoff location. So that's how they went around this. They basically said it would be too complicated to get the data from the drone. Most drones don't have GPS information uh, available other than DJI and the, the ones that you buy uh, out there. So that's that's kind of how I think it's going to work. I think there's still a lot of unknown uh, going from here. So, uh, good morning from Gainesville. Uh, friends in Gainesville. One of my best friends lives there. Uh, Don, Deacon FPV says, uh, he says they will probably use some sort of frequency hopping. Yep, frequency hopping. Don knows a lot about frequencies and, and, uh, and the controllers and everything. Uh, good morning from Columbus. Good morning. I uh, have many questions. Philip Miller says he has many questions. Philip. Leave them in the comment. We'll uh, we'll get to them. Um, Ryan says, "Good morning, my classmates. California. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lots of good mornings. Awesome. Um, hello and good morning. Let me see here. I have a question. I have a new. Oh, that, I'm sure this is going to be a good one here from David. Uh, I have a new DJI Mavic Air, which came with ADS-B in." reading the FA document, it seems that the use of ADS-B will not be allowed. Is that correct? So um, I, this is a great question, David. I'm so glad that you mentioned this. Uh, it's a great question because um, there is a confusion with ADS-B. So in the regulation, the FA has said you cannot use ADS-B as a mean of compliance for remote ID. What this means is there's two types of ADS-B. There's ADS-B in, which receives an ADSB message from someone that, that's sending it, and then there's ADSB out, which broadcasts an ADSB uh, message information. So what the FAA says is we don't want drones to be equipped with ADSB out. You can get ADSB in. That's not that's not um, that's not restricted. The FAA doesn't say you can't use ADSB in. They're just saying you can't use ADSB out to send the remote ID message. And the reason they don't want you to use ADSB out on a drone is because it would congest the signal. Uh, ADSB was designed for manned aircraft to send the information to air traffic control and to send the information to other aircraft in the area. So this is something that's actually, it's an amazing technology that's really making manned aircraft aviation safer. What drone manufacturers like DJI have decided to do is to capture that ADSB information and give it to you as a drone pilot so you can be safer, which is awesome. So if there's a, uh, an aircraft, a, a manned aircraft flying around, basically saying, uh, hey, I'm in the area, here's my message, and then your controller can receive that information and then display it on your screen. Uh, what the FA doesn't want you to do is send your position into the ADSB system to other aircraft because it would congest the system. So uh, ADSB is somewhat limited in, in, um, in how much information it can handle, so they don't want to overwhelm the system, so they're using a different system, which is going to be remote ID. So that kind of brings to some questions from other people that say, well, will manned aircraft be able to see us on their radar or on their screen? And the answer is no, unless they're going to be equipped with something that receives remote ID information. But they don't need to see you because you are supposed to stay away from them. They don't have to uh, give way to you, you have to give way to them. So that's kind of the, the background information. We don't want to overwhelm somebody flying in an airplane at 100 to 500 miles an hour when uh, they don't really have to worry about your information. So uh, see and avoid is on your side, not on their side. So that's kind of the idea. But great question, David. So um, so your, your Mavic Air 2 will be just fine with ADS-B in, uh, just no manufacturer is going to use ADS-B out to comply with remote ID. That's the regulation. Uh, Central Massachusetts, we have uh, Lewisburg, uh, North Carolina, Alabama. Uh, okay, what do you believe, here's a question here. Uh, what do you believe is going to be the best for operations, a module add-on or it being built in? Uh, personally, I think 
uh, it's going to be the, the built-in, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the, the module is going to be good if you have an older drone that doesn't really have the ability to uh, comply by itself. Uh, if you're flying FPV, the module is going to be uh, how you're going to do it until somebody uh, creates a module that you can actually add, I think, when you build the UAS. The, the FPV community, I think, has been the most vocal at this stage about this because, primarily because uh, the, there is no real clear definition, again, of what visual line of sight is. And, um, and, and visual line of sight right now, as an FPV pilot, is allowed if you have a safety pilot with you. So that's kind of uh, where I think the FPV community is sitting right now, uh, trying to figure out if this is going to work or not. So, uh, But that's, uh, in this case, I think a module will just add more complexity to the system. So having it built in, if you can, is gonna be good. The good news is because we have so many uh, months, I mean, we have until 2023, middle of 2023, to comply with this, um, chances are whatever drone you're flying today is gonna to be, and you know, it's gonna be an antique by the time you get to 2023. So I think this will be really, the, the only drones that are gonna be flying with the module are older, uh, FPV drones or older drones that people, and I shouldn't call them drones, unmanned aircraft like a fixed wing for example that people have been flying at an AMA field but even then if they're flying at an AMA field it's probably going to be uh, considered a fryer so they can fly there without having remote ID so I think it's really not that big of a deal but um, another question here from Sophia's phone it says uh, when using a module is there any rule that would prevent them from walking to a new location during the flight to avoid harassment. No, uh, actually, this is something that people have said, hey, uh, because uh, if you've watched the video from before the one I put on on Friday, I was very vocal about the fact that um, now people will be able to find you because, because your location is gonna be broadcast. If you're using a module, you could take off and then walk away to a different location and then that would never be shared with anyone. That new location wouldn't be shared. So uh, if you wanted more privacy, that's definitely one way around it. Um, I wouldn't abuse it. Well, I mean, I'm not gonna say anything. Uh, I just don't want the FAA to change that regulation in the future. So I don't want, want to make sure we don't um, abuse that. Uh, California, Kansas City, uh, let's see. Pennsylvania, Texas. Wow, we get people from all over the place. I love it. Uh, I hope you can make this viewable later in addition to the live feed. Yes, uh, I don't know how the live feed works with YouTube. Um, I don't know if the question, I think the questions can be reviewed as well. But since the question is put on the video right here, as it's being recorded, uh, then the question will be available when you watch the replay. So you won't miss anything. And, uh, and yes, this will be as soon as we're done live, it's gonna be saved on YouTube and, and be watchable. So uh, Chicago, Providence, okay. Uh, how, does, how does this change the drone training you offer? Uh, have people that sign up before the changes? That's a great question. Um, at this stage, really not a whole lot of impact on the regulation. Uh, the, the changes that are happening in the near future, which is gonna be around March, is gonna be at adding training to uh, for night training and the good news is I've been teaching night training for uh, for almost 20 years now to many aircraft pilots so I've already started to create the content for this I'm going to be recording it next week and then adding it to the course so it doesn't really change anything the regulation for part 107 is still mostly unchanged except for the flying over people section um, I'm going to add the flying over people uh, information as soon as we have a better date for when the data is published uh, on the FAA website. So the January date when that stuff goes live, I don't want to record any videos before that date is in there because I want to include the date in the training. Uh, but uh, as far as the night training, this will be all available and it's also going to be available on the FAA website for free. So, uh, But I know what the FAA website training is going to look like. It's going to be text. It's going to be fairly boring and dry. Uh, but kudos to the FAA for putting this out there. So we'll have something that's a little bit more easier to digest and, uh, and available to you guys. So that's coming up very soon. Uh, you'll have it way before it goes into the training, uh, way before it goes live on the test. That way you can digest it. For people that are taking several months to do the training, we have people that do this, they'll be ready by then. Um, I'm gonna send you guys an email when everything goes live. Uh, I'll have notes in the course of things that have changed. So if you're coming back from before, uh, there'll be something that tells you it's been updated. So. I'll make this easy on you guys, that's what I do. Uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, wow, we got people all over the place, I love it. 
That's my coffee cup. I need to get a Pilot Institute sticker on there. Uh, hi from Chicago. Okay, great overview. Thank you. You guys have really enjoyed the video, I think. The, and it was an hour and a half long. I wasn't sure how much people were going to watch uh, because it's such a long video and it's kind of a, a dry subject, but it looks like a lot of you watched it, so I, I, that's really cool. Okay, if I take here, if I take the test this week, this is a really good question. Will I need to take a follow up test uh, to fly at night or just the FA night training? Really good question. So if you take the test this week or up until March, middle of March, whenever that date is going to be, because we don't know yet. But if you take the test between that time, then if you want to fly at night, only if you want to fly at night, then you will have to do the recurrent training, the free recurrent training on the FAA website, okay? So if you're taking the test now and you wanna fly at night, then you'll have to do the training when it becomes available. Once the new test is out in the middle of March, then once you take the new version of the test, then you will qualify as, uh, as night trained and then you'll be able to fly at night provided that you have the light on your drone, okay? Um, so that's, that's, I want to make sure that I answered all of that question, uh, just the FA night training. So you want to have to take a follow-up test. Uh, the, the, actually, the, let's put it in a very simple term. Once you do, between now and March, once you do the initial test, that's it. That's all the only test that you have to do. The only thing that you will have to do is the recurrent training, uh, when it becomes available. If you take the initial test after March, whatever, 2021, then you don't have to do anything for another two years. And then in another two years, you'll have to get recurrent training. There's no more UGR. There's no more recurrent exam, $160, whatever. You'll have to do recurrent training. And also what I'm going to add is the FAA is working towards something that is the equivalent of the WINGS program for men aircraft pilots, which is a set of classes that you can take and get credit for over time and have that qualify as your recurrent training. So um, let's say that you find a course on the FASafety.gov website that has uh, information about, I don't know, Lance as a refresher, then more than likely you'll be able to use this, and this is still something that's in progress, you'll be able to use this as so many credits, and then when you have enough credits, then it counts as your renewal. So um, for me, as a man aircraft pilot, this is how things are done. Uh, I have to do, every two years, I have to do a flight review, but I can also use credits from the FAA under the WINGS program to qualify for flight review. So that's uh, a portion of the flight review. So that's kind of how, how that, that portion works. So I hope this kind of makes sense. Um, here. How likely will a firmware update enable remote ID on DJI uh, Mavic Air 2 and Mavic 2? Uh, I've been following on YouTube, uh, on, not on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, Brendan from DJI, Brendan Schulman. Uh, he's been responding to a bunch of these questions and it looks like they're gonna have a solution to make that happen. So I'm pretty confident that most of the drones that were built recently by DJI uh, will be able to be compliant with remote ID by using a software update. We'll talk about this some more when I meet next week with uh, Kenji and, um, and Vic, because I think they have some really good information about this. Okay. So many people from everywhere. I'm only halfway through the comment. This is going to take a while. Somebody says, I took the test two times and have the same score two times. <laughs> How can you get the same score two times? I live in... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Same score two times. It sounds like you just missed the same number of questions. So that's, um, if you're not part of our course, we'll help you. We get um, only five people ever have failed a course using our course. So if you need help, join uh, our course and we'll, uh, we'll take care of that for you. Hey, hey, good morning, peeps and fearless leader. Definitely fearless. Good morning from New York. Okay, uh, with remote ID, here's another good question here. Um, it says, with uh, remote ID in place, do I have to go through lens every time I calibrate and fly about 10 feet to check calibration in my backyard? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the legal answer and then I'll give you the uh, whatever makes sense answer. Uh, 
well, actually with remote ID in place. Okay, so with remote ID in place, you will not, okay. Remote ID and Lance is gonna be two different things. They won't talk, okay? Remote ID is just broadcasting your signal out there. You can still fly with remote ID and bust the uh, requirement for Lance. Let's put it this way. So let's say that you're in a, an, a, a Lance required area and you forget or you don't know about it and you take off. As long as your broadcast module or your aircraft is broadcasting remote ID, it's not gonna stop you. It's not checking to make sure you have Lance approval, okay? So in this case, theoretically, you could take off, go 10 feet off the ground to check your calibration and then land. Now, here's my recommendation. Um, because you're checking calibration, you're making sure that the drone is actually flying correctly. Something could go wrong where the drone could very, very unlikely, but could just take off and then go to a place where it's not supposed to go. If you don't have lens approval in this case, you're gonna get in extra trouble, okay? So it doesn't take really long to do the, the, uh, the, the, the lens approval. So I would just go and do the lens approval. That's just my kind of my two cents. But in, in reality, you could just take off and, uh, and not have to worry about lens approval because it, the two systems don't really talk. Uh, there was actually a discussion in, uh, in the document, in this huge document here, where somebody was uh, asking if the message should contain lens approval so that when the authorities are looking at a drone that's flying around, they can see if it actually had approval or, or not. And uh, the FAA said, we're not gonna do that because it's too complicated. Um, we'd have to gather the message and then send it into the thing that it just doesn't make any sense. So they, they decided not to do this. So I hope this kind of answers your question here. Uh, another question here. I, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions about the uh, the Mavic Air 2 and the, all the DJI drones out there. So. Uh, what does this mean for the Mavic Air 2? It really depends uh, on what uh, DJI is going to do, but I, I'm pretty sure DJI is going to uh, help with this and, and uh, make those compatible as long as they can, obviously. Uh, Philip Miller saying, how is FPV legal if it's not true V-loss? Uh, FPV is really on paper technically only legal if you have a visual observer with you. So the visual observer is a, is acting as your line of sight. So that's that's how it makes it legal in there. Um, do you think DJI will upgrade the, Mav, the Mavic Magic 2, the, the Mavic 2 software to include remote ID? Yes, I, I do think they will. Uh, here, my question is oh, flying indoor. Good question. I'm sure there's going to be a good question here because uh, this is something that the F hasn't really thought through. My question regarding regards flying indoor, I assume that without GPS coordinates, the ID won't allow the aircraft to fly. That's correct. Does flying indoor work under FAA airspace? If not, how could you fly inside? Um, so there was actually a mention of this in the, in the explanation to the regulation. And the FAA has basically said that uh, this could become an issue. And I think I mentioned this in my video that I did on Friday. Basically, if you don't have a GPS signal, then you can't send the entirety of the message element on remote ID, which means that technically you're gonna be grounded. Now the FAA said, we're gonna leave it to uh, the manufacturers of the remote ID stuff. And then maybe if you're indoors and you're not getting GPS signal, then it can send a special signal that is allowed that basically send, hey, this person is flying indoors. Um, Somebody had mentioned online that you just put a piece of tinfoil on top of your drone and then it becomes, uh, it blocks the GPS signal and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, in this case, if you have a module, there's gonna, there's gonna have to be some kind of coding in the remote ID module that basically says, this thing is indoor, let it fly. And uh, so hopefully that's something that they put in place. As far as your question asking about uh, the FAA airspace, the FAA only controls uh, uh, outside of buildings. So if you're flying indoors, none of the FAA regulation applies. Uh, the liability still applies, but not any of the FAA uh, regulation. So 
here any idea if the client will be an app or just a web address for the public to get the info? Uh, my understanding is gonna be an app. This is gonna be your cell phone. Uh, it's gonna receive the signal and then display it on here, give you information about location and all that. I'm, I'm just gonna assume it's gonna look like a map and then you'll be able to see a bunch of dots that are getting captured. And with a direction and altitude, you'll be able to tap on it to see the license plate of it. And, uh, and of course, see where the pilot is located, which is not good. David says, just completed the 107 course. Uh, I'm set to take the exam January 13. I assume the test question will reflect everything that was covered on the exam, but not include any new regs. That's correct. There is no new regulation in there until sometime in March. And obviously, you guys will know when that happens. Uh, it's going to be very visible. Could you break down the new night ops over people vehicle basics? Uh, night, ops is, uh, night ops is rather simple. You can fly at night as long as you have either taken the new exam from the FA, which will come out sometimes in March. And if you haven't, then you'll need to do recurrent training, not exam, recurrent training for free on the FA website. Once you do that, then you will be able to fly at night. So that's the, the, as simple as I can make it. Uh, flying over people is not easy. So here's what I'm going to do though, because um, let me just create a new scene here and um, I'm going to do this and this. Okay, so this should be uh, my Excel spreadsheet that I built earlier. And um, here is Something that I built, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see. Uh, if you've watched the video that I made on Friday, there is information in there about, uh, about flying over people. I revised it so that there is more information. So uh, what it comes down to, if you're gonna fly over people, you need to fly with a drone that is either category one, two, three, or four. Category four, I'm gonna skip it because category four is really not uh, all that exciting. So um, it's something that has to do with part 21, not something that the majority of you are gonna have to worry about. So with that being said, um, if we go in here, you'll see category one is gonna be our drone that weight less than 0.55 pounds on takeoff. Now remember, if you have uh, any kind of prop guards on it, it's not gonna qualify under this. So it, this is gonna be like the bare bone drone right here. Um, for all of the, and then category two and category three are gonna be larger drones less than 55 pounds. For all of these, there is a requirement that you can't fly if you have exposed parts, okay? You can't fly if you have exposed parts, uh, rotating parts. And, uh, and that's important because what it means is uh, you'll need to have either prop stop or motor stop installed on the drone. So if something happens, the, the prop stop, or you're gonna to have to have prop guards. And then, for two of them, category two and three, there's a requirement that there's no safety defect. This is, I'm not gonna really go into those details because that doesn't really matter too much at this point. Then there's an injury limit, which means that if you're flying a category one, there's no limit to injury, which means that the drone can hit someone, the FAA says that's fine, it's not gonna kill anyone, we're just gonna keep it this way. For category two, there's a limit of 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy, and then for a category three, it's 25 foot pounds. So basically, just look at these numbers as there's a certain force on impact that these drones need to meet in order to be approved to fly over people. So. Uh, because there is none of these requirements for category one, then the means of compliance and the declar declaration of compliance are not required under category one. Means in compliance, declaration of compliance is basically uh, paperwork that DJI or whoever is doing the paperwork is gonna have to send to the FAA to get approved to be a category two or category three. So that's required right here, category two and category three. Uh, there's a label requirement for category two and category three. I did not see a label requirement for category one. So um, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I missed it, but anyway, not, not all that important. This is where it gets complicated. So um, let me just bring my face back because I wanna take a break from this video here, from this slide. Where it gets complicated is the fact that there's really three different scenarios if you think about it. There is flying over people quickly, transit, okay? There's flying over people for an extended period of time. So hovering over them, flying on top of them and just doing loops, that's 
kind of a second requirement. And then there is flying over people for extended periods of time over what the FA call open, open um, crap, what did they call it again? Um, uh, open air assembly, okay? So essentially there's three different situation scenarios if you want to think about it this way where there's different requirements for each so that's where i think they could have made it a little bit easier but they didn't so let me go back to my excel spreadsheet here so you can see it so in here essentially what it's saying is uh, let me just get to it there you go if you're uh and there's operating requirement th that this line right here is just a a, a reminder of what i talked about earlier uh, where can you fly over people? Category one, you can fly anywhere with the operating limitations below. So let's say you have a category one DJI drone, uh, Mavic Mini, Mavic Mini 2, and can you fly over people with remote ID until 2023? Yes, as long as you're not doing sustained flight over an open, over open air assembly. So if there is a concert right now until 2023, you can do that unless you meet remote ID requirements, okay? and you have no rotating props that can cause damage. So it means that you would have somebody, DJI would have to modify this drone so that there's a prop stop or some other things uh, so that it still stays below 250 grams and you can still do that. So that's, I, I hope this gonna make sense right here. Uh, in terms of sustained flights over one person or over just a few people, what we don't qualify as open air assembly, it's good as long as you're not flying over them for uh, for open air assembly and as long as you don't have rotating props uh, that can cause damage. And then in here, sustained flight over open air assembly, yes, you'll be able to do that as long as you meet all the requirements that I said previously and you have remote ID. So that's hopefully, that's not getting you guys too confused, but uh, I can probably put a link to the spreadsheet uh, later on. For category two, for category two, yes, you can do the same thing. It's pretty much the same requirements. You have to be labeled as a category two drone, and then you also can't fly a sustain over open air assembly unless you have remote ID. So that's the same thing. And then uh, can you fly in transit? Yes, you can fly in transit as long as, again, you label as category two, you meet all of these requirements that are right here. No rotating prop, no safety defect, uh, typo right here and then the 11 foot pound has been met, you have MOC, DOC, all that stuff. So that all needs to be met and then you'll be able to fly in transit really quickly. Category three gets more complicated because you have to fly over a restricted site. You have to be over a restricted area and you can do sustained flight over people. You can't, uh, you ha you can't leave the restricted area and people have to be on notice. And then you have to be labeled as category three and meet all the requirements that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, the 25 foot pound, the MOC, DOC, no safety defect, and all that stuff, okay? I know it's confusing. And then, uh, can you fly sustain over people? Kind of, uh, with the category three. The FAA says that uh, they have to be directly participating or they have to be under a covered area, which is the old regulation for flying over people. Um, and I don't want to talk too long about this, but I think it's important that I mention it. Uh, and then here, a sustained flight over open air assembly, never. You'll never be able to do this because you can't leave the area uh, that, uh, that is restricted. So open air assembly by design is um, defined as a public event. So if it's a public event, it can be restricted. So that ain't, that ain't gonna work. Whew. So that was, <laughs> that was a breakdown, an, an easy breakdown of um, this. And then flying over people, uh, flying over moving vehicles, um, flying over moving vehicles, uh, how am I going to explain this? It, it basically, uh, you'll be able to transit um, over them as long as you are category one, two, three, or four, you'll be able to just do a quick pass. So for example, if you wanted to cross a highway to get on the other side, you'd be able to do that. Sustained flight is only gonna be in a restricted area. So um, unless you shut down the highway, then you won't be able to fly over people, uh, over moving vehicles. Uh, in this case. So, okay, I, I'll stop right here. This was a good question. I know it took a while. Here, Phil says, theoretically, FPV is supposed to have a spotter. They do at my, yep, that's right. Um, the, what do we know about home built use for part 107? John, that's a good question. Uh, that's actually a question that I have for Vic. He may have more information uh, or he may have read the regulation differently than I did. 
I found it confusing in there. Uh, there was a bit about, and, and I'm going to take too long to find it in my book, but um, the, the way it's defined, it's for educational purposes or for recreational purposes. But then somewhere it also mentions that you can use it for uh, part 107 purposes. So I don't know. I'm a bit confused about the home build. Um, my guess is that... Um, My guess is that you will be able to use it for home built as long as it meets the remote ID requirement. Um, you'll probably have to slap a module on top of it. I think the the exemption from home built was to meet the exemption to meet the requirement by mean of compliance, if that makes any sense. So I think what they're saying, if you're doing a home built, then you can use a, a module on top of it to comply, you don't have to submit all the expensive paperwork to comply. I think that's what the regulation had said, but sorry, that's one question that I have that I can't really answer uh, too well. Does the new regulation allowing flight over people moving car at night only apply to part 107 pilots? And uh, does that include recreation pilots? That's a really good question, Nate. Yes, it only applies to part 107 because the regulation lives in part 107. So. Flying over people, flying at night. So let's let's take each case. Flying over people, flying over moving vehicles. At this stage, until 44809, section 44809 of the USC, the US code is amended, then you won't be able to do that. Uh, so you'll only be able to do that as a remote pilot. And for flying at night, at the moment, you can fly at night as a recreational pilot if you fly in uncontrolled airspace. You cannot fly at night in controlled airspace because there is no process to request the approval. So that's kind of where we sit right now. Uh, so that's, um, yep, only for part 107. Here, night flying, strobe lights, how many are required? One, uh, top or bottom, it doesn't say on the FA website, but let's think about this. The position the light is designed to help people to help other aircraft see you so putting it on top makes more sense than putting it at the bottom now what you could do you could have one on top one at the bottom to help you to see the drone but that's not the the purpose of the light the purpose of the anti-collision light is anti-collision it prevents a collision with other aircraft so think about it this way Why are model aircraft being grouped with drones? Uh, it's a good question that I don't have the answer to, unfortunately. Uh, the FAA has basically said anything that flies up there is, uh, is a UAS, an unmanned aircraft system. So uh, it, they don't look at it as a quadcopter or a fixed wing or model aircraft. They look at it from, uh, from a weight perspective. So if it's less than 250 grams, then it becomes a UAS that's less than 250. If you fly it for recreational purposes, then you can do it without remote ID. That's, I don't have a good answer, sadly, about why they grouped everyone together. When will remote ID go into effect? For you, um, September of 2023 is when you have to comply. So you get a little bit of time. Is drone a part of requirement for becoming a commercial pilot who works for an airline? Nope, no, it's not. Completely different license. So to become an airline pilot, you have to get first a private pilot certificate, then a commercial pilot certificate, and then an airline transport pilot certificate. Drones are a different um, certificate. Mavic Air 2 uses OQSync 2.0 RID, is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Does anyone know if the Air 2 will broadcast Wi-Fi? Um, OQSync 2.0 uses 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz, which is the same uh, frequency. So um, my guess would be that, yes, it should be able to do that. Uh, Thanks for this information. I have a question about the broadcast message. Could they eventually change the message to leave out the pilot location? I agree with you on how dangerous it could be. Um, <laughs> could they? Yes. What would it take? Uh, an act of Congress, I think, if I understand this correctly. It would have to be Congress that mandates a change in regulation, and then, uh, and then it would have to happen. So uh, my understanding is if, you, if we want this to change, then we need to get our elected officials involved so that they drive the change. Um, so that's... The, the question, the better question, well, not better question. The question really is from a 
uh, boots on the ground standpoint, is it something that can be done and that can be done so it works for everyone. I talk a little bit about this in my video, but um, uh, Wolfpack says the TSA security threat assessment is run by TSA every quarter on all pilots and pilot applicants. Actually, I did not know it was run every quarter. Uh, so thanks, Wolfpack. I know I can trust that piece of information because uh, Wolfpack is extremely knowledgeable about all of this. Uh, all, including, all including aircraft are considered on my aircraft system. Yes, that was somebody responding to somebody else. Okay, here. When will the subject begin to show up on the 107 test? March. March, sometimes in March. We don't know exactly yet when, but sometimes in March it will show up in there. Uh, how will the broadcast message appear on someone's phone? Notification, text message. Uh, I, I, I don't foresee that it will be sent automatically. So I don't foresee having a pop-up message, hey, there's a drone flying on top of you. Uh, at least I hope the apps don't do that. Um, my guess is you'll have to log in. If you see somebody flying, you'll have to log in and then get that information. I thought drones with the, let's see here. I thought drones with the add-on module couldn't leave line of sight, thus limiting. Yes, that's correct. Line of sight will be um, will be required for drones with a module. Uh, actually, I mean, it's, it's still required for drones that have remote ID integrated into it. It just means that um, drones that have a module will not be allowed to fly beyond visual line of sight, even with a waiver. I think, th th I think that's the way I read the regulation. Are there any concept examples of hardware that intercepts or can read the display broadcast? Just wondering if this is can be done with someone like a cell phone. Yeah, the idea actually, Mark, is that um, a cell phone will, is all that's going to be required in order to capture that message and display the information. If the module does not communicate with the controller, how can the pilot be notified that a, there's a module failure? That's a good question. I actually wondered about this as well, Jim. Uh, Jim has been a, a, a longtime follower, and I think Jim is a student as well of ours. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know how the module is going to tell you that that there's a failure. I, I don't know. I, that's going to be somebody's going to have to be creative with this one. Uh, will the remote ID module aid in lost drone location on older drones? Um, I thought about that, and yes, I think it will. And the reason I think it will is because the FA has said, as long as your battery is still working, and as long as obviously the module is not destroyed in the crash, but the FA has said that they want the information to be available from the time of takeoff to the time of shutdown, not landing. So landing will not stop the broadcast. And I think that's also part of the reason why the FA and probably the security agencies wanted it to be done this way because they wanted to make sure that if a drone crashed, that they would be able to go collect it to get the evidence. That's, that's my guess. Um, where am I at here? Here, you guys have so many good questions, I love it. Will night ops still require a visual observer? That's a good question, Edward. Uh, somebody else asked me that same question. Uh, no, I don't, at least not what I've seen in the regulation. It doesn't look like the visual observer requirement stayed. So all I've seen from what, 107, whatever it was, for 29, I think, for night flying, uh, it says that you only need to do the training and you only need to have a strobe light, So, which is good. Um, I mean, obviously, at this stage, you're going to make the decision whether you need a VO or not. Uh, I fly at night usually to do light painting uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on photography. And, uh, and I don't really need to have a visual observer when I do this because I'm in the middle of nowhere where, well, it's not really an issue. So uh, I'm glad that they actually get rid of this thing. Uh, if you need one, then uh, uh, if you need one in terms of training, I would say... Uh, put together something to help them get trained. This is something that we're working on as a as a course, but uh, it's going to be a little while before we have it ready. Um, will remote ID be a system update for Air 2? If not, how do you go about getting the module? Um, uh, Tony, I, I don't know. I, I'm hoping, yeah, it will be available, so we'll, we'll find out. Uh, the module will be available, I'm sure, very soon. We'll get plenty of time to worry about this. Uh, any idea if the remote ID info will be integrated into ADSB so that many aircraft... No, I mentioned this a little bit before in this video, you may have missed it, but no, uh, it won't be in there just because it will um, just... Oh, you said just answer, okay. Has the issue of flying as a recreational UAS pilot 
uh, only at CBO field been clarified. Okay, hold on. As the issue of flying as a recreational pilot only at CBO. Oh yeah, um, recreational pilot will be able to fly anywhere they want as long as they meet remote ID requirements or if they are sub 250 grams. So uh, no, recreational pilots will not be limited to CBO fields or fry as, as they're gonna be called going forward. Um, and that's good, we definitely don't want that. Um, David says that means I can continue to use ADSB in, but also, yes, yeah. Oh, uh, let me put that one up right here. But also add a new module. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I notice there's an IFR class added in your online menu, which is good news to everyone. Yeah, that's for uh, our instrument courses for manned aircraft pilots that want to learn how to fly. Um, as a private pilot student, would you recommend everyone to complete both the PPL and IFR? Uh, yes, definitely IFR will make you a much better pilot. I don't want to talk too much about this because this is a drawn video, but yes, absolutely. You should get your instrument reading. Once the system is implemented, will helicopters and many aircraft pilots be able to know the location of nearby drones? Not unless they have their cell phone turned on and they're able to do this, or not until someone creates a, a receiver that can be added to the equipment on board of the helicopters. Um, could this happen? Probably. Uh, you know, if I were a helicopter pilot, I would want to be able to see that information just from a safety perspective. So uh, at least the ones that are in conflict with my, tri uh, my, my flight path and my flight plan, I would definitely want to know about this. Um, what is the remote ID that is built into the Mavic Air 2 already? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there's been a lot of confusion about this and, and I hope DJI renames that thing in the app. In the DJI Go4 app and I think in the Fly app as well, there's a little section called Remote Identification, which is DJI's own version of Remote ID before any of these standards came out. Um, is it compliant right now? It's not. but it's what DJI has been using to demonstrate the capabilities of doing just what the FAA just proposed. So, uh, so that's good news. They, they, they've been using this as, a, as an optional platform to show that remote ID can be accomplished using broadcast. So that's, it's not compliant right now, but it likely is gonna be the technology that DJI uses to do this. So uh, at this stage, call it DJI's remote ID, or I hope they maybe find a different name in the meantime so people don't get confused thinking that they actually do meet remote ID requirements when they actually don't. So, um, so yep, yeah, that was a really good question. Ed says, the regs appear to require full-time VLOS and not just VLOS availability, does this render an automatic orbit follow me mode when the US is behind? Um, it's, it's always the same kind of thing with VLOS. Um, VLOS is really designed to be not, you, you don't need to be staring at the drone 100% of the time. What the FAA wants you to do is they don't want the drone to ever leave your field of view if you want to think about it this way. So um, can you look down to look at your altitude to kind of frame your shot? Absolutely. Can you look around to look at other traffic and make sure that no, nobody's going to come and hit you? Absolutely. You don't need to have it 100% of the time eye to eye, you know, eye, eye to drone uh, connection. Uh, what the FAA doesn't want you to do is go behind a building where you would lose visual line of sight for an extended period of time. As a matter of fact, if you read the preamble to part 107, they do mention that you can lose visual line of sight even for a short period of time to go around a building or to go around something. Now don't abuse that, okay? Don't go around, well, something for an extended period of time or don't go miles flying and then getting in trouble. So uh, that's kind of the idea. So the, the, since the, the regulation hasn't changed for V loss, then this is kind of the way that we're gonna go forward the same way. Will the remote ID uh, allow civil or commercial aircraft to see and avoid? I, I think I just answered that question. No, they won't unless they have the equipment uh, on board. When this comes into law and we already have a drone, how much would it cost to make our drone legal? That's, I don't know the answer to that one just yet. Um, it's it's going to depend on how much they sell the module for uh, or if they allow you to uh, have a, a software update which is going to be free. More than, I mean, I don't see why they would charge for that. So uh, so I, I, I don't think it's going to be a big cost based on the information I've seen so far. 
Will the public be able to see the information? Yes, unfortunately, they will be able to see the information and uh, including your location if you have a full uh, remote ID aircraft. What is the existing remote ID in, okay, I just answered that question right here. Thank you so much for bringing. Do any of the current small anti-collision lights, the one that can zip Velcro, meet the FA requirement for night flying? Uh, <laughs> so this is kind of a loaded question. Uh, it, the, the FA doesn't approve these lights. All they say is they have to be visible from three statute mile distance. So um, do they meet the requirement? It depends if they've been tested. Uh, actually, I, I have um, I have two different sets. I have one on Inspire 2 and I have one on my other smaller drones. And they, they both have different visibility. I, well, I think one is more visible than the other. But uh, when you buy them, see if it says how far they can be viewed from. And if it says three statute mile, then you have to kind of take the manufacturer uh, and, and believe what they're telling you, or you can go and test them yourself. So that's. That's my answer and I'm sticking to it. Air 2 Mini 2 Anafi seems to have some sort of remote ID setting. Yep, that, I think I just answered that question right here. Hey, Vic Moss is joining us. Let me see if I can add Vic. There he is. Hey, Vic. You're on. I'm answering a whole bunch of questions in here, so I hope you can <laughs> chime in uh, as we go. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, this I'm sorry morning. I'm running late this morning. Uh, no worries at all. Um, so I'm going to keep going through the list right here. We've got, uh, we got a lot of question answers so far. <laughs> so, and awesome. there's still a lot to go. So, uh, do we know when existing AMA field operators can apply for fryer status? Yes. Uh, this is going to start, uh, what was it? 12, uh, 18 months, 18 months, 18 months from, yeah. 18 months from, um, implementation, which is 60 days after publication. Yep. So 18 months is when that's going to open. Now there's been a big change here, which is good. Uh, the FA was only going to allow applications for 12 months. And then they decided that they were going to change that and actually make it so you can apply in the future as well. And uh, the application, once it's approved, it's going to be good for 48 months or so for four years. So that's kind of a good thing right here. Uh, next question. I recently purchased a DJI Mavic 2 Zoom. Uh, has DJI already integrated remote ID? So we've had a lot of questions, Vic, since you're just joining about the DJI drones. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've heard? I know you've probably talked to Brendan a little bit more about what's going on with uh, the remote ID with DJI. I think Vic froze. Oops. We'll get back to that in a second when Vic comes back. Uh, I think the confusion surrounding here, here's another question. I think the confusion surrounding existing RID field in pilot software is just that ID, not real time data. Yep. I agree. Okay, Has the FA decided on. what type of network will be used? Uh, public providers such okay. as Verizon. Uh, <laughs> so there's no network. There's no more network in here. Uh, Shane, this is um, this is the great news, actually. A at least for now, there's not going to be uh, there's not going to be any of this in here. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna remove Vic for now and see if he can come back. Um, something has beeped. Hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so in this case, the, the network requirement that was in the NPRM no longer exists. So that's a good thing. We basically have uh, no, more, no more network requirements. So Verizon and all of this is not going to be required to fly your drone, which is, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I know I'm sure they're not very happy about it, but uh, a lot of us have been asking about this. I see Vic uh, smiling about that. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. My, they worked on my, well, my internet in my neighborhood. Now my internet doesn't work very well. So oh, it's, nice. it's, it's, been a, it's been a constant set of uh, phone calls back and forth with Comcast. Um, to get back to your question, I did hear it about DJI. Um, some of their newer drones uh, will more than likely be updatable via a firmware push. But um, there's still some technical aspects that have to be done. Uh, specifically, oh, what is this? I can't remember exactly, but it, they're working on it. They're working on it. Um, worst case scenario, some of the older ones will have to go into module. Yeah, so that's that's what I had thought as well. So I think that's good news. Mm -hmm. And I think not only for DJI, but for Hotel and I'm sure uh, um, Skydio. All those will guys. Be, yeah, we'll be kind of the same way. 
Good. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here, after taking the night test, how will we be able to show we qualified uh, if asked by authorities? Uh, you'll get a certificate as you typically do from the FA. Uh, you'll get an email confirmation saying that you get credits for whatever it is that you took, and then you'll be able to just print that. I would just save it into a folder, put it in your fly bag, and then you have it available uh, just so you can fly with that. Um, I, would, I would take it one more step and actually have a PDF on your phone as well. Yeah. Yeah, have a PDF as well. That's what I do. I have everything saved in a PDF. Yep. Um, what about an existing waiver, Robert is asking. I'm guessing you're probably asking about the night waiver. Uh, so the night waiver is still going to be valid for a, a certain period of time after all this goes in place. Uh, the FA has put that in place so that they can, you can continue to operate without having to do the training online. Uh, I think it's 120 days after publication date. That's when they expire. Correct. And then um, the um, and then just take the training in the meantime. So the training has a 100, 180, sorry, 180 days or 120 days from implementation, not publication. From implementation. Okay, yeah. So that extends yeah. it pretty pretty far. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about the, the the training because some people, yeah, I know it hasn't been asked yet, but I'm sure it's coming. The um, there's kind of a cool down period where the training is going to be available for 15 days where you can take that, that training. Once it becomes available on the FA website, you get 15 days to take the training and then you will be able to fly using the new rules. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because I don't want you guys to go on there all at the same time. Uh, there's like 200,000 remote pilots at the moment. So we're going to kill the system if we do that. If you go on day one and you take the training on day one, it doesn't matter. You can't use it for another 15 days. So spread it. You'll be fine. You'll be getting training anyway through our course if you're a student, and then uh, and then you can just go through and, and supplement with the FAA. So, yeah, um, the FAA fully expects uh, FAA safety.gov to crash. To crash, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's, <laughs> it's they're they're working on it. it. It's in the plan to figure something out. But yeah, it's uh, I would strongly suggest holding off. Yep, definitely hold off. Uh, here, how many how people are on this? You know. Uh, right now, we've got 200 people. Okay. Here's a hint. I'm not telling everybody. <laughs> um, if there were thousands, I wasn't going to say this, although people will hear this more. If you really, really want to do it, 12.01 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, in theory, maybe give it to 12.05. Uh, if you're really hard-pressed to do it or just want to be one of the first, set your alarm or stay up and take it then. Yep. Yeah, and don't I, log on 10 o'clock in the morning that first day. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> yeah, gonna happen. Um, yep. Here's another question. How do you think the interface of the DJI Fly app will change uh, to help you see and avoid other aircraft? Uh, actually, Vic, do you? I don't, I don't see it. it. Um, can they? Absolutely, because they have air sense. So they can, they can incorporate something um, into that. With the with the fly app, there's wait a minute, yeah the fly app has it doesn't it? Yeah, uh, because the Mavic Air runs on that, doesn't it? Yep, yep. Okay, okay. I got rid of my Mavic Air after I tested. Yeah, the Air it. Two and the Mini um, Two both do that. Oh, cool. Oh, the Mini Two does. I didn't know they're yep. doing that because uh, yep. um, it's not it's a sub two fifty. But um, can they incorporate it into it? Quite possibly. But will they? That's 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 yet to be seen. Yep. Uh, what about? FA night training for existing Part 107 pilots. So then you'll have to go on the website to do that training for free from the FA. So that's kind of an easy one here. Uh, it seems that recreational flying is less restrictive uh, than Part 107 certification. How does Part 107 increase our privileges? Mm. Uh, there, there's several things that Part 107 allows you to do. Um, flying above the grid number in Lance, for example, that's something that you can do as Part 107. With permission. Enough. Yeah. Huh. With, with permission, with permission. Yes. <laughs> with permission. Um, really, if you think about it, I mean, now flying over people is going to be uh, the only way to do it is going to be by having part 107. Um, and then flying in zero grid with permission is, is something that you can only do there. Uh, flying at night in uh, controlled airspace is also something that you can only do as part 107. Uh, can you think of something else, Vic? Yep, the big one is uh, the 400 foot bubble that we have oh, yeah. 107s. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah. if you're within 400 feet above and 400 feet within the structure, yeah. you can fly without additional permissions. And uh, 4409 hobbyists don't have that. Yep, 400 feet AGL, that's it. That's the only that's thing right. that you can do. So. so if you have a 402 foot building in front of you, you're going to run into it. Yep. 
Uh, do you recommend any flying organization like AUVSI? Um, <laughs> it's a loaded question. Um, I mean, AUVSI does a lot, a lot of great for the, for the community, I think. Uh, they, they do have lots of good information. Uh, join their mailing list. I mean, you don't have to pay for the, for the, the, mm -hmm. the monthly fee or the, the yearly fee, even though I don't think it's that much money. Uh, it just provides you with good information. They have some good uh, meetings to go to and even some of them that are live. Not always very cheap. I know it's, it's something that people uh, kind of grill them for all the time, but they do provide some good information. I would suggest DSPA, but that's just, you know. Oh, that's me. right. <laughs> well, you, you guys provide a different service, but yeah, I, I mean, definitely DSPA, yeah. uh, who is going to help you. And if you're a drone service provider, definitely join DSPA and, uh, and get a voice out there so that you can, um, I mean, AUVSI has a voice, but I've seen some of their comments right. on the NPRM and I was not always in agreement with what they said, so. Uh, here, someone from Colorado, just like Vic. Uh, why is the FA grouping model aircraft, which are directly being controlled by a pilot, being lumped with the drone category? Uh, so uh, that question just came up, but maybe you have a different answer than I do. I don't really have a good answer why they draw. I mean, it's it's an, it's a drone. It's something that flies up there that's radio controlled. That's really the idea from the FAA. Right. Well, basically what the FAA has done is, it's not, we're not drones, we're UAS, unmanned aircraft systems or unmanned aircraft vehicles. And that doesn't matter if you're a, you know, a Tello, uh, a, a, a DJI or a Tell or something like that, or if you're flying a 125th scale turbojet. Um, you're in the air, you're part of the NAS, a national airspace system. Uh, so you're, you're flying no matter what it is. You aren't all considered drones. It's unmanned aircraft systems and yes. so if you're in the air you're just going to be part of that group uh no matter what yep. so that's that's that's, that's where, where it comes from really um it's, it's not, not so much your drones it's just we're all the same yeah yeah and that's kind of what i said earlier so i'm, I'm glad you said the same thing mm -hmm. uh, i'm taking my exam this saturday any study content change nope not until march you don't have to worry about it so go take your exam you'll do just fine uh remote? in person oh yeah, huh? yeah of course yeah sorry yeah, yeah it would yeah, be in, in person, person at this point sorry Yep. My yeah, about and yes, months, yeah. yeah, it has to be done in person. The initial still has to be done in person. I know some people have asked that question. Uh, remote ID once activated cannot be turned off. Should I store more quadcopters over the winter month? Well, no, actually, that's not true. Um, it, right. it, it can be turned off. It just can be turned off during flight or before flight. So it has to be available. But no, you can turn it off. That's not a problem. Yeah, from takeoff until you shut it off after landing, it will be active. Yep. Well, until shutdown. Right, until shut, yeah, shut off after landing. So shut yep. down after landing. That's yep, a yep. better word. I'm a commercial UAV pilot for police department. We have been working as part 107 due to lengthy process. Can we now fly night missions without a COA? Yep, as long as you meet the requirement that I mentioned before, which is mm -hmm. to do the training and then have the, the light on your uh, drone and you'll be good to go. So yeah, that's a big deal for... I would, I'm sorry, I would take it one more step further in a situation like that when you're working with the police department, first responders, um, whatever uh, aspect, or even a company, even a large company, they're going to change their rules probably so um check with that and uh, their legal department or their uh, their flight commander or whoever and uh, they'll let you know if any anything has changed but as far as the faa no nothing will change yep you may have already answered this but the mavic air become remote id yeah we just talked about this you should be good to go with uh, most of the the dji drones out there uh, the remote ID identifies where I'm located because of my controller. Can an indiv individual citizen acquire my personal information while you're flying your personal uh, information from... No. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a misconception. I think we've seen a lot on different forums. Uh, the only thing that's going to be available to the general public, I shouldn't say only, but the things that are going to be available to the general public is... Uh, an ID number. Think about it as the serial number for your drone. They don't have a way to cross-reference that number with any databases. The, the database for registration is not available to the public, so nobody's going to be able to find your address, your phone numbers, your name, or whatever. They'll be able to find your location of where you are when you fly the drone. Uh, if you have a drone that has remote ID incorporated into it, uh, if you have a module, they'll be able to see the takeoff location of where you were. But that's really all that there is in here. So no personal information. We, thank God. Let's not change that. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and if, uh, if law enforcement needs it, they have to show cause. So, you, you know, your next-door neighbor's a cop and says, I don't like you flying. Yeah. Um, he can't just go 
talk to the FAA and get the information. Yeah, because the Plus FAA the is going to be... Your neighbor already has it anyway, but still, you know what I mean? Because the FAA is going to be the holder of that information. It's not like it's going to be available to law enforcement. They'll have to request access to that information before they get it. Yep, yep, that's important. Uh, Craig says, will your night training course be a standalone for those who already completed part 107? I haven't really decided on that. It's definitely going to be part of the course, but you know what? You have free access to the FAA course on there. I know it's probably going to be a little bit drier, but um, we'll think about making it uh, available as uh, something else. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it's text. If, if you've ever done yeah. training on the safety.gov website, it's mostly text. Uh, the, I, I doubt there's going to be any videos for that. Um, but that's fine. We'll, we'll take care of you guys. Uh, who else in here? John says, I have to renew by the end of March. Okay, this is a good question. Uh, by the end of March 2021, can I avoid the $160 fee uh, by waiting? Uh, it's all going to depend on when the regulation goes into effect. So um, the end of March, Vic, do you, I mean, I have a good feeling that by the end of March, we will be ready for that. I would be amazed if the, if the uh, Federal Registry isn't published this month. I mean, just yeah. I'm totally amazed. Yeah. Um, which then the 60 days kick in. So you're talking middle of March. Um, yeah, it's, I would, yeah, I would wait if I was doing that. Yeah, and for this I case, actually, it would be 45, April. it would be 45 days for this one. Well, if it's January, if it, let's say middle of January, so February, March, so that would be 60 days. Um, and since you're in March, you're not technically out of out of uh, um, currency until 12:01 a.m. on April 1st. Yep, on the end at the end of so, at the end of March. Last you, you should be good. No, yeah. you know, I don't have crystal ball, as I said, but I would be amazed if you weren't. Yep, I agree. I get my 107 back in the fall. What do I need to do to qualify for night flying? Um, you'll have to just go to do the training on the FAA website for free. That's really all that, uh, and sometimes in March, like we just said. Uh, oh, there's still a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, well, it's okay. Yeah, we've been going for an hour and 15 now. Uh, have you talked about, uh, let's see, have you talked about that, that have a daylight waiver and is going to happen when the published date? Yeah, so, yeah, we, we just mentioned that the daylight waiver, you'll have an extension, so you'll be able to keep using it for a while. Uh, and then we'll have more dates when the actual date is published. Will lens be updated to allow 107 to obtain clearance to fly at night in controlled airspace? No. You, you're shaking your head no. Not yet. That is one of my questions as well. Yeah. Um, it is being addressed. They have to figure out exactly how that can be incorporated. When the uh, ATC, UAS, POC, people of contact, person contact, set up the Lance system, their grids uh, are for daylight use. So some won't change more than likely, but some may at night. Um, it's totally up to each individual ATC. So FAA is, is working on that. Okay. Let's just leave it at that. That's, I've been, I've been, I've, it's, yeah, it's been, it's just been, it, they're working on it. That's all yeah. I can get from them. And that's, that's the reason why right now you can't submit a uh, uh, recreational pilot request at night because of, of, of this issue. So uh, so only via the drone zone at the moment is what, when that comes into effect, that's what we're gonna have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, what form will the proof of night training take? Print a document from the FA online course? Yep, pretty much you'll get a graduation certificate and then that's your proof of training. Uh, just passed my test on Tuesday. How long does it typically take to get the certification number? Uh, about 30 days, uh, 30 to 40 days is what we've seen with our students typically. So that's what oh, is okay, being... Cool. Yeah, I'm, that's sorry, what's... I'm seeing some around 60. Oh, okay. But, wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. 30 it, to 40 it, is what... COVID has messed think. everything up. Yeah. <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. It's probably longer now. Uh, indoors will be very limited in altitude, right? Uh, so they should be able to sort out this issue. Uh, yeah. So we had this discussion before. Vic, and this is from 20 minutes ago, so this is how far we are down the list. Uh, there was, um, uh, somebody was asking about flying indoors, which is obviously going to be an issue because you'll have no GPS signal, so no element. And I know the, 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 the final ruling has talked about this and saying that maybe somebody's going to come up with some special uh, digits to put in there so that it can comply. What's your take on this? Um, they do have to figure out the integrated side, so the um, um, broadcast part, not the module part. But the FAA does not control indoor flight, so it's going to be a technical issue 
from the aircraft when you turn it on, so for um, to go through the startup process to check uh, check our ID. Yep. Uh, so it's not necessarily going to be an issue with FAA rules. It's just going to be an issue with the um, with the RID and integrated RID. Yep. Uh, if you're module, it won't matter. Good. Here's a good question. After completing the training on the FAA side, will there be an updated card issued to reflect the permission to fly at night? Nope, nope, you'll just have your certificate. Now, something that people always get confused about, your pilot certificate, when it's issued, it does not expire. So you'll never get a new card unless you lose it and then you request a new one. But even in the past, when you did recurrent training, you never really got a new card. All you did is you kept the certificate as proof of, of currency. So in this case, you'll do the same. You'll just have your certificate proof of currency. So if anybody from the FAA asks, then that's what you're going to give them. Uh, studying for the... Okay, will, will the credit for recurrent training take effect when completed or tag on to... Hold on, let me put this one up here. Will the credit for recurrent training take effect when completed or tag on to the... Yeah, as soon as you take the training, that's when it starts basically. And that also resets your clock for two years. Right. So now you're 24 calendar months. So your 24 calendar months um, is gonna start back from there. So uh, for people that are gonna do this in the future, once you take the new test, let's flash, flash, fast forward to March of 2021. You're going to take the initial test. The night training is going to be in there. You'll be tested on it. And then from here, you start the clock for 24 calendar months. After 24 calendar months, you no longer have to take a test. All you have to do is take recurrent training. And then you'll be able to reset the clock again. And uh, I was mentioning earlier, Vic, about the, the WINGS program equivalent that's going to be kind of put in place and uh, how people will be able to do not only night training, but they'll be able to do other type of training to stay current and then get credits for that. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so 24 months from when we get, we start to be able to take the recurrent, the same thing's going to happen again with a bunch of people flooding a website. So what I would suggest in a situation like that is take it 23 months after your initial, uh, or after your recurrent. And yeah. so that way, you know, you lose a month, but so what at this point, it's free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the free part is kind of a, a big deal. Will it be a requirement for home-built UA to fail-safe prevent the vehicle from flying if the RID module is not functional? You're shaking your head no, Vic. Yeah, no, uh, the module does not have a, a fail-safe integration. Uh, oh. If it fails, it, um, it's up to the pilot at that point to make the decision or operator. And um, yeah, that, that's when if you're inside, it's gonna be a lot better off to have a module than uh, integrated. But um, yeah, no, it's, it, the module itself will not be integrated into the flight characteristics of the aircraft. Okay, so that's cool. I actually had, that, that was a question that came up and I didn't have the answer. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, okay, I didn't that's... either until a couple of days ago. I get to hang out with some pretty smart people. So yeah. Um, yeah, mean, that's, that's to, always the key. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's good. That's good to know and kind of share, share the knowledge. Uh, where are we at here? If flying, oops, let's do this again here. If flying indoor with a module, can you simply set the module outdoors? Will it be, well, you'll have to keep broadcasting throughout the entire flight. So no, that's not, but from what Vic is saying, but again, and from what we've seen, matter. yeah, I don't think it will matter. The FAA doesn't care. Yep. How about flying Addy mode with remote ID? Um, let me no think about that. I mean, the, the, you're still, you're still broadcasting, whether yeah. it's integrated or module. Yeah. You're just not using the, Addy mode, all it does is it turns off the aid, the, 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 the helping mechanism that keeps the drone in place. It doesn't shut off GPS completely. So you'll still be broadcasting right. your information. So that's, that's, yeah, that's not a problem right here. Uh, where are we at here? Good question. Yeah, that was a good question. That had me think for a second here. Uh, I know you focus <laughs> on DJI, but do you have any info on hotel? Hotel more than likely will do the same thing as DJI. Um, uh, Mavic Air 2 with prop guards would be probably a category two. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say if, if so what, what have you heard ASTM, about that? ASTM should have their standards up pretty soon. I'm assuming we're talking over people at this point. Yeah. Um, and we can't really say yes or no infinitively on anything yet, but um, with once ASTM does come out with their standards, which ought to be pretty soon, Kenji's part of that, so that's really nice. Um, it would probably fall under category two uh, it's just going to have to be the testing that backs it up to make it actually qualify. Okay. 
Yeah, so it, it is possible that all these drones, I mean the Mavic Air 2, I mean the Inspire and all of that, it would qualify for two or three. I don't know about the Inspire 2, right. it might be a little too big, but might well, be with, category with three. Well, with the uh, prop kill and uh, um, parachute more than likely. Yeah, parachute for but the... Yes, it's got to be tested. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, drone are getting more... Like the government is trying to make it so hard. Well, it, they do get involved, unfortunately. So does this apply in yeah. Spain? No, it does not. All this regulation only applies in the United States if you're flying in the United States. So uh, no need to worry here. But I will kind of add to that a little bit. Um, in the aviation industry, it's sort of like as the FAA goes, so does the world. Yep. So, you know, there's a, there's a good chance that something like this will possibly be um, uh, part of some of the other countries at some point. Yeah. Well, but and, right now, no. And, and France just put out remote ID pretty much just like what they did in the U.S. a couple months ago. So um, you can expect it, especially with Europe right now. Europe is trying to centralize all of their regulations. So uh, EASA will more than likely do that. So uh, is there an outline as to how the FA will determine how the 11 foot pound of kinetic energy is determined, uh, that's not up to the FAA actually, that's gonna be up to the manufacturers to figure this out. So uh, they're, they're saying, hey, this is the requirement, you guys play with it, and then you tell us how you're gonna make it happen. It's, it's called performance-based standards. Perf yep. um, and what I like to do is, when I'm trying to explain it to somebody, is like the NTSB says, if you have a 5,000 pound car going 50 miles an hour, you have to stop in X amount of feet. Yep. So then it's up to each individual automotive manufacturer to figure out how to do that and prove it. Yep, absolutely. Um, so that's basically a good way to put it. Somebody says, I would not be surprised if a kinetic energy question shows up on the part 107 test. Oh, you bet, you bet. I mean, uh, the, bet, yeah. they updated the, uh, the standards if you want. They haven't updated the Airman certification standards yet, but the regulation tells you what is going to be covered on the test and they've added night and then they talk about part 107 regulation. So anything that's been added is fair game starting in March when the regulation goes into... You won't have to figure out kinetic energy transfer, but it will say something like, hey, to fly under category two, you have to have ABCD. Yeah, yeah. And there's not going to be formulas point. about how to figure out kinetic no. energy. <laughs> no remote pilots would ever fly. Um, <laughs> well, very few. A 250 gram drone flying and falling at 20 miles an hour, 32 is 14.7 pounds, foot pound of kinetic energy. Okay, he'll, he'll keep flying because he's smart. Interesting. Yeah, I know. That's awesome. Um, all right, let's see. Wait, there's still a lot of questions. I, I can see the little scroll bar at the bottom and it's going. But, but a nice thing while you're doing that, the 250 gram catalog does not have a kinetic energy transfer. Yeah. Uh, aspect to it. So yep. it's strictly under 250 and no rotating part for the last rate scan. Yep, correct. So yeah, it would be, it would, this, these will be a lot easier to fly over people for sure. And then remote ID if you fly over open air assembly for a sustained amount of time. Uh, will people needing to pay the 160 to renew? Nope, no more 160. Um, PSI is going to lose a lot of revenue on that, easy revenue. Uh, will they allow online renewal testing for part one seven? Yep, we mentioned that a little bit here. Nope, it's training. Oh, yeah, training. Yeah, good, good catch. Yeah, <laughs> testing no longer exists. Training now. Exactly. Uh, how will flying next to railroad tracks, uh, how long will I be able to fly my Mavic 2, my Mavic Pro? Um, flying next to railroad tracks never really been an issue uh, in this case. So uh, the only thing that's really restricted with railroads is being on their property when you fly. They don't like that. Uh, so don't, don't fly from their property. But, I mean, flying over trains technically is... Uh, is legal. Yeah, um, I think he's probably referring to the, um, uh, uh, shoot, what's it called? The uh, uh, for critical infrastructure yeah. um, aspect of it. Lots of, lots of organizations, I fly over a refinery and they get really upset about it. Uh, I just have to every month because of a situation. But, but um, the first time they flew, they came out and said, hey, we're critical infrastructure, you can't fly over us. So um, just because they say they're critical infrastructure doesn't mean they are. There is a specific DH list, DHS list, sorry, um, of specific critical infrastructure. Yeah. Um, just because you're on the, you know, you call yourself critical, it doesn't mean you are. 
Um, and it's not an all encompassing, all refineries. It's certain refineries, you know, certain nuclear power plants, that kind of stuff, dams, that kind of stuff. And it's all state by state as well, if I understand correctly. It's, it's a bit- uh, No. That's, no? It, okay. Well, it is. Um, you look at the Texas law and it's, it, it says critical infrastructure and it lists all those things I just mentioned. Um, but state law is trying to control the NAS and that by definition is preempted by the FAA. Um, so with what the NPPA is doing in Texas right now, hopefully that'll be thrown out. Um, but again, it gets back to the land use issue. Um, and so technically states can't control the airspace, yep. although many try. Yep. Oh yeah, for sure. But that doesn't mean you can't get cited. You'll just have to fight it if you do. Yep. And that's, yeah, we've, we've been, um, we, we get a lot of questions on a daily basis about where okay. can I fly locally, you know? And so we, we actually put a, a wiki, uh, for those of you that don't know, we put a wiki page together that is uh, user managed. So if you find a restriction somewhere, you can actually add it to the wiki and then it will show you all the state laws and all the regulation and it's updated as it goes. So what we found is over time, all these pages that have information about restrictions, they never get updated. So the next day, they're pretty much out of compliance. Right. So we have it so that you can actually help manage the page. So uh, it's been, it's actually been working. Awesome, would you send me that link? I didn't know you had that. That's yeah, good. yeah, that's, it's somewhat new and we're still making- It should be somewhere on the computer. Yeah, we're, we're making tweaks to it as we go and, and it's still awesome. a fairly new project. So we haven't advertised it a whole lot, but we've been getting quite a few people yeah, contributing. Yeah, it's uh Yeah, it's, it's important. And then user manage the wiki makes the most sense because people can go in there and make changes. So. Um, Okay, as I read it, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's a Mavic Pro question. You can fly to the end of time if you put a module on it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep, good question. Yes, I mean, it lasts that long. Walter White is with us. Look at that. Um, hey, oh. Walter. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, I missed it up. No, I lost my spot in the questions. I would like to point out the Mavic Mini Mini Tour 249 oh. without. Um, they would go over with. Yes. Yep. Um, a little in uh, no confirmation. Let me just put it this way: Japanese batteries weigh a whole lot less. Yep. If those can be um, imported into the United States, there's no confirmation on that. There's a good possibility that the Mini and the Mini Two um, will qualify for Category One on the day it's operational. Oh, interesting. So yeah, because that it's is not confirmation. Because it's 199, I think, for a gram for the the Japanese version. For the Japanese, if, if and I, I think remember, the, the cages are less than 50. Yeah, it's 242. I waited oh, mine, I weigh here. mine. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's 242 for the Mini 2. The Mini is right at 249. It's right at the edge. But the the new batteries Ooh. are lighter on the Mini 2 than they are on the old one. Uh, so the I did, Japanese and then I put I put the prop guards on there too. It's 258. I think I mentioned it in the video somewhere. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, if we can get those Japanese batteries here in the States um, with the prop guard, they should come under then. Yep, it would definitely work. But again, no confirmation from DJI. I tried to ask and it's the weekend, so they couldn't get, an, they couldn't get a, a confirmation for me. Cool. I should try to get Brendan on our uh, meeting next week so he can uh, get grilled on all this. A Wednesday? <laughs> yeah. I think that's short No, this isn't going to happen. Um, okay, one of the flying over people thing was people being hurt by props. Yep. I would assume that DJI could shut down the motors on free fall programmatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. I, I would. Yeah, they could. They could. Yeah. Um, same type of stuff that the parachute companies do, uh, Pair, uh, Pair Zero and uh, Indemnus. They have that motor kill switch based on accelerometers. Um, so yeah, uh, that it, all it says is rotating stuff can't hurt people, and so if your props aren't rotating, you're fine. Okay. Somebody else brought up that they could also make breakaway props, but I'm not sure what breakaway props on a drone. No, I don't. I don't think so either. That yeah. That would be I'm, a horrible idea. I, I'm sure there will be new t other technology um, yeah. added in the future. That's kind of the great thing about regulation, in a sense, is that it brings up smart brains that create smart yeah. stuff. So performance-based stuff is it really it really uh, um, fuels the innovation. Yep. If you part 107, can you still fly a sub 250 gram drone as a hobbyist without remote ID? Uh, as far as I think, yes, absolutely, you can. Uh, uh, you, you can just fly, have... it's a part 107, you can fly under a uh, hobbyist or under 107. You just yep. have to decide at time of flight. At the time of flight. Now, here's one question that I, that I thought about. Um, if you fly it for both 107 and recreational purposes, um, at one point, remote ID is going to be required for part 107 for the sub 250 gram drone. So 
I wonder if DJI is going to ask you when you take off if you're taking off as part 107 or if they're just going to basically broadcast based on the fact that you're part 107 certified. Well, since your uh, your uh, RID can't be tamperable, um, yeah, it's it's you're not going to be able to turn it on. Yeah, so I'm I'm guessing yeah. when you enter information in the Mavic in the in the Mini, you're going to have to answer a bunch of questions and say, "Are you part 107?" And then that's going to turn on. I'm I'm guessing remote ID. It'd be interesting because that's going to be I a just, dual purpose. I don't purpose. think turning on and off is an option. Yeah, if it's, if it's integrated, it'll be on from lift off until you shut the motors down after landing. Uh, what is it going to take dead for the FA to understand the give people location is a big mistake? Yeah, well, um, they yeah. understand it now. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure they've gotten the word. I mean, they got the word before with the uh, 50,000 comments. I'm sure 45,000 mm -hmm. of them told them not to do it. But um, so, what, what's well, your take I'm, on on how that's going to change? Do you think there is a possibility that this is going to change? Um, no. Be the reason it's there is because none of the federal security agencies would sign off on this if it wasn't there. Um, so it's not really, we can't even blame the FAA for this, it's, it's the security agencies. Um, when I got, uh, I was one of a select group of, of people that got the, the rules early on uh, Sunday morning before it came out. And that afternoon I sent a uh, uh, tersely worded email, I think is a nice way to put it, um, to say that this, this is a huge issue. Uh, and it was also then addressed before rollout in our meeting, and they understand it, and they are going to try and work on ways to get the public to understand that interfering with us is a federal crime. They're actually going to add that wording uh, in some aspect of it, uh, the, the, the drone aspect of wording, to um, the flight crew. So we will be a flight crew, and they'll make darn sure that people understand that interfering with the flight crew is a federal crime. Good. Well, and yeah, it's already think, a federal crime to do it now. So I think there's going to have to be somebody made an example out of when the first time that happens, uh, because you know right now it's it's been they, they've been really reluctant to do this. Even with shooting drones, mm -hmm. you've been very involved with this, and um, yeah. they, the the yeah, it's it's just not good. So um, basically, I told them I didn't tell them. I suggested I don't tell the FA anything. <laughs> um, I don't want to sound that way, but I suggested that it be. Uh, somebody is made an example of quickly, um, more than once, and publicly. Yeah, yeah. The publicly part is always the, the it's always the difficult part with the FAA because I've talked to FAA inspectors in the past, and I said, why don't you guys? Because they do investigation, and you know that. I mean, mm -hmm. they they investigate, they issue fines, but they don't advertise it because their lawyers don't want them to do that. And, uh, and, right. and that's too bad because I think it would, you know, send the word to a lot of people that, hey, stuff is happening. The FAA is doing stuff. So, um, OK, I've been on. involved in four different investigations I can remember um, in different aspects of it. And I can't call and ask how it's going. It has to be a FOIA because yep. I'm not an FAA employee. That's right. Yep. Um, OK, there was a good question here that I saw. Oh, yeah, Will says, uh, looking forward to what drones will come out in the next two years that are Category 2. Uh, yeah, and I, I think oh, what we'll see, we'll see not only that, but I think the next set of drones is going to be compliant very quickly with remote ID as well. Uh, I don't see DJI or mm -hmm. any of the oh, big guys to, yeah. Yeah, selling anything. And I'm pretty sure, actually, that's why the, um, the Mavic uh, 3 Sorry. Pro has been delayed for so long. It's, I mean, it, it just wouldn't surprise sense. me. Yeah. Um, and that's speculation on both our parts. Oh, so, yeah, of course. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the new FA regulation already came into effect, correct? No, not yet. Uh, not until it's published and then not after a certain period of time. So you've got time. It's not in effect yet. And then even when it becomes in effect, you still don't have to comply with it for remote ID for an extended period of time. So We had a timetable um, published at the uh, DSPA um, uh, blog. Yep. So if somebody wants to go to that. I'll put a link down in the comment when we're done in the section. Awesome. So, and so this does apply to fixed wing RC planes. Yes, absolutely it does. Uh, unless they're sub 250, in which case they don't have to comply with remote ID. So Or fly to Freya. Or, or fly to Freya. Uh, Freya. F Freya, is that what you say? Yeah, Freya. Uh, fe federal, uh, FAA recognized identification oh, no, zone. I, I, was oh, saying area, the, I was saying the pronunciation. I call it Freya. Yeah, everybody else calls it Freya, so oh, okay, well, that's your I'll change. <laughs> it's like you're getting fried, Freya. It's a Freya. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, that, that, that'd be a really bad name for it then, wouldn't it? No, um, and the Freyas are going to be much easier to come, come across, so that's going to be really nice. Cool. 
Uh, I've just joined a part one seven. Uh, where, where do we take the FA test safely during the COVID conditions? Um, there's no real option. You have to do it in person for the test. So uh, look for a place that may have a small room where there's only one computer, and then you'll be the only person in there. But that's really the only way to do it. Well, when, when I, took I took my, my second, second recurrent, recurrent um, it was during all the silliness. And um, the place I went to is the third time I've been there. There's three computers, but you only allow one person in the room at a time. Good. You're masked up, and then they clean it afterwards. So they do have, uh, you know, they do take care of it as well. So um, unless you're a super high risk group, then I really wouldn't worry too much about it. Yep. How would Remote ID in its current form address issues for BV loss? The FAA keeps throwing out that carrot and I don't see how it's not. It wasn't really designed for this. And, and, and no. if you've watched my video on Friday, I kind of touched about this a little bit, but the FAA basically kind of gave up on trying to make this a one solution for all immediately. They wanted to roll this thing out quickly. So they basically focused on most of the operations out there, which are non BV loss operation. Mm -hmm. And they said, and you know, if you watch the video, I said, hey, we're, we're not done with the requirement for a uh, network. That's going to come back in the future, more than likely only for BV likely. loss operation. And uh, but they wanted to roll something out that works for most people. Now, right now, BV loss is, is governed by a slightly different set of rules with waivers and all of that, which requires different technology. So we don't really have to worry about it. But right now, that doesn't really answer the question of making BV loss operation routine. That's not the goal of this regulation, but that's uh, Jed. Jed is, uh, is on our page a lot, asking a lot of really good questions every week. So good. Uh, that was a good Ask question. those questions. Well, I would say that the biggest, um, the best thing that's gonna really push BV loss forward is gonna be UTM, so unmanned traffic management. And um, our ID is that first building block that, uh, that uh, UTM is gonna have to be built on. So. Is our ID directly tied to BV loss? No, but it is an integral part of it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, the, the UTM, if you guys are interested in knowing more about UTM, there's a 80, 90 page document called uh, UTM ConOps, Concept of Operation 2.0. Uh, really good read. Actually, I've, I've been planning to make a video for a while to explain what's in there because uh, it, it kind of puts all the puzzle pieces together, make you understand where the FA is going with this. It's only a concept, but there's such good information in there that you kind of understand why all this is being put in place. So I'll make a video eventually on this when I stop sleeping. Uh, get on that. <laughs> I am a licensed commercial pilot. I want to be licensed drone pilot. Would, uh, would you re would recommend just taking the test as if not a pilot or through the test for the pilot? Um, it really is up to you. Um, uh, the, the, your knowledge as a commercial pilot is going to only take you so far. The Part 107 regulation is never covered under flight training, and, and we do flight training, so I can, I can tell you that, and I'm a commercial pilot as well. So, um, And then your knowledge of airspace, as good as it is, is a different set of skills that you would apply as a, as a drone pilot. So I would say find information that will make you current on these topics, at least, at the very least. Uh, battery management is also another one that is not covered under, under uh, pilot courses, typically manic craft pilot courses. So I would look into all of this, and then obviously you can do it the, the, the easy way, which is go on the FAA website, do the training, as long as you're current with your Part 61 mm -hmm. uh, certificate with a flight review, then you can do that. Uh, I would say, I, I, if you guys watch me, been watching me for a while, I'm not about just passing the test. Uh, I'm all about you being proficient and knowing what you need to know to be proficient and not be a danger in the airspace. So uh, I would say do the test online, but educate yourself and learn more. That's kind of, um, well, that's, that's, right, my that's story one of the things I really like about what you do. You don't just teach to pass the test. Uh, there are some out there that do that and yeah, that's fine. Um, you pass the test, but there's so much more you have to learn after you already know the test. Yep. Um, and you, you're really good at doing that for people already. Yeah, and you know as well as I do, because you're on forums just like I am, and you see the questions. I'm part 107 certified, but, and here's my question. And I'm like, you should know this. You, this is something, so that's kind of the reason why I created these courses is because I wanted you to have the background understanding why we do things and giving you, most of the time it's because of many aircraft, not because, it's 
due to the fact that there are many aircraft pilots flying in the air. So uh, we, um, I gave you that background and, and that's helped you really understand all that stuff. Okay. Um, is there I'm gonna get on my soapbox for just a second, if I may. Say <laughs> what? It comes to stupid questions online. I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Yeah. Um, if you have what you think is a stupid question, please ask it. Yes. Because I'm of the mindset that I would rather have you ask a stupid question that you think is a stupid question and make a stupid mistake that's so that it's just apparently easily prevented. Yeah. Um, and if you're on one of these forums and you see somebody that you think is a stupid question, either don't answer it or answer it nicely. Yeah. Um, I see so many people, oh, what's this? It's like, you should know this. You call yourself a 107, blah, blah, blah. It's like, don't do that. Yeah, don't be a dick. Because yep. people are going to quit asking those questions and stupid mistakes are going to happen. Yeah. Just if you if you can't be nice, but my mommy, everybody's mommy used to say, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at don't all. Don't say anything. Yeah, and I agree. Rather, don't say nothing at all. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just pass on it or be helpful. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, yeah. I'll my box, sorry. And no, 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 that you, you, you uh, absolutely right. And, and you know, um, the, um, and I've said this in my message for Christmas to all my students, I said, be an educator, help other people. There's going to be a ton of people that get into this for Christmas. They're going to get a new drone and they're not really going to know what to do. Educate them, spend a few minutes saying you can fly over 400. You can't fly near airports. You have to get approval, uh, download before you fly app, just so you get information, all the basic stuff that we can teach, go on the FAA website. So, uh, so yeah, you're right. As, as an educator, we should all be really educators out there. So good, good, uh, good. Every mention. time we fly, we're an ambassador to the industry. Yep. And not only that, but a student, I mean, I still learn stuff. I'm sure you do mostly oh, yeah. on a daily basis. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> never stop learning. <laughs> Actually, I find myself sometimes, I was like, crap, I've been teaching this, not wrong, but not as well as I could. And then it kind of goes back and then it starts to fall in place. And I don't know, it's just cool. Is there any indication that the manufacturers will provide a consistent implementation of RID or will there be any a solution available specifically? Yeah, I mean, I, there is lots of indications so far. I think a lot of them are still trying to figure out how it's going to happen. But yeah, I think all the big manufacturers out there will definitely have a solution. Mm -hmm. We mentioned that. They're just holding their breath for the ASTM standards at this point. Yeah. Once those come out, um, they'll just jump right in. Here, do you think remote ID, do you think with remote ID in place, they may consider BV loss eventually? We, I think we just had a discussion about this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. I'll take an act of Congress to filter the pirate location in the app. Uh, it would, but um, I don't know that it's going to happen. Yeah, although the FAA can make an emergency rule, like what they did with the um, uh, original hobbyist um, registration. So it's in their power to do it. Um, whether they will or not, they're going to have to get a lot of people to sign off on it, You know, like we mentioned earlier, the uh, yep. federal security agent. Yep, I agree. When does this go into effect? We kind of mentioned that before. I want to wrap it up because I still see questions coming up and we're not anywhere near the bottom of the page, so. <laughs> Oh, well, you can good. save some of these for Wednesday too. If you yeah, want. yeah, that's true. We could, we could, uh, I could stop it eventually. Let's keep going for a little bit more, and then uh, we'll we'll go to two hour mark, another fifteen minutes, and then uh, and then we'll stop after that. This is a good one right here. Uh, do you know if the FA will be logging RID receivers and their operation as criminal evidence should anyone abuse the? Um, so, from my understanding, and then Vic, I'll give you the floor after that. Uh, th there's no real way to capture that data because it's just a broadcast. It's just a signal that is being sent. Now, I thought about this last night because somebody else mentioned that uh, the only way really would have to, for someone to install a receiver somewhere to be able to collect that data over time, which I'm not saying is not going to happen because it could, uh, but that's really the only way right now. So it's not something that's going to be recorded in your flight logs, although your flight logs are going to be recorded. So the FA can still use that uh, if they are available and uh, if you provide it to them. And otherwise, no, I don't think so. Right. The only exception to that would be some of the smart cities out there that already have some of these grid receptors up. Um, they could modify those to store the data. So, but with the pilot location being known, there may be some Fourth Amendment issues with that. But I'm, I tell everybody, uh, you, you're, you're getting legal advice from somebody, or, you know, from somebody with an art degree. Yeah. So, um, is it possible? Yes, there'll be some T's that need to be crossed and I's that need to be dotted first. Yeah, and I'm sure there's going to be to be even 
and, and not only that, but then to be used in court against you is something mm -hmm. even completely different. So yeah, yeah. self-incrimination. Yeah. Yeah. We, I don't know. I, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but uh, we'll yeah. see how this goes forward. Uh, did they mention the safety test? This is a good question. That was supposed to come out last summer for all drone pilots, and that was supposed to come out late December. Uh, I wish we had Kevin here to grill him on that. <laughs> Kevin Morris. Well, uh, I did. Oh, you did? Well, I mean, I grilled him a couple of months ago asking him what was going on and yeah. he told me he said uh, December and uh, and I'm sure, I mean, I know he has a lot to do and, and so so what, what was the latest? It's there, it's ready. Um, they just, the good old dot some I's and cross some T's. Um, they just, that's all they need to do. It's ready to go quarter one next year and it could literally be next week, but I don't, you know, I don't know. It's, it is going to happen. Uh, same thing with the CBO developed um, with the FAA on their safety regs. Yep, the last two things. The last two pieces of 4.09. Yep. yep. So, um, and then there was one more step that they have to do before that is they have to select the, the testers. And I think that's... They have them. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know if the testers know that yet, but they do have. They've got that stuff all set up. Um, I don't know if they have the complete list, but yeah, they do have it. Cool. All right. Uh... I hope that was allowed to share that. <laughs> well, we'll find out. <laughs> is your phone ringing yet? Oh, well, there's a Not twenty. There's a twenty second. There's a twenty second delay, so you'll see. Um, George, it says I'm in class Gulf airspace and see helicopters flying at about five hundred feet, which worries me when operating the drone at four hundred. Uh, what do you have an advice on this? Um, this is a tough one because, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand, is that. Helicopters are allowed to fly below 500 feet, uh, unlike manned aircraft that have a lot of uh, other manned aircraft, I should say, that have a lot of limitations. Uh, but helicopters have kind of a, a different set of, of regulations. So, uh, with that being said, my recommendation is keep your eyes open. If you fly in an area that you know there's a lot of helicopter traffic, um, get a drone that has. Um, ADSB in that can receive the signal if they are transmitting that signal, obviously, right. and then get a visual observer. If you know you're flying in that area that is tough, get a visual observer to help you and be your eyes in the sky. Uh, always have a procedure in place in case that happens so you don't have to think about it. If I see a helicopter coming, what am I going to do? Am I going to drop down? Am I going to get out of the way? More than likely, you're going to drop down, but you need to think about these things. You know, when, when I fly an, an actual airplane, and I'm sitting there, the one thing that I'm thinking about when I'm not thinking of something else is where am I going to land if I lose my engine? And this is something, it's, it's ADM, it's aeronautical decision making, it's something that you have to be ready for. So every once in a while, you're looking around, you're looking at your, at your thing, and then you're seeing where there's an airplane, an airport nearby, or a field or something, but it's always something that you have in mind. So kind of the same idea here, just be ready for it. And Vic, you may have some additional tips, because I know you fly, uh, you fly on a regular basis oh, yeah. for your business, so... Um, and for myself sometimes, too, because I'm a hobbyist, too. Um, but here in Colorado, we're lucky in that all the, all the choppers have to have high altitude props. So you hear them a long time before you see them. Um, as they're coming in, uh, especially the DOD helicopters. Uh, and the other thing, if you're going to be flying in an urban environment that does have some of the, um, you know, the, the, the flight for life type helicopters, uh, medically back, um, Find out what frequency they're on and buy an aviation radio and monitor it. Oh, yeah. 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 Back I in the day, that we had to have 10729 waivers. Back in the day, wow, we're already, we're already using past tense on that. <laughs> um, that was one of the things when I was working with people on their waivers. It's like you mentioned that you're going to have an aviation radio to monitor the helicopter uh, frequencies. Yeah, and it's important, and and not all of them are going to be unfortunately talking on the on the radio, and and sometimes right. it's hard to find which frequency to listen to. But if you're near an airport, I always tell people if you're going to operate near an airport, get one of those portable radios, and then just listen. And it's it's hard to do. I mean, it's even hard for me to do, and I'm used to listening on the radio all the time and talking as a pilot. But uh, it's it's just you have to concentrate on doing this and then listening. It takes some skills, but have your visual observers. You know, if you're operating yeah. near an airport, don't listen to yourself. Yeah, you, you should just be doing it and train them on how on how to do this. So, right. um, yeah, lots of really and another good... quick option I would suggest if you're doing uh, very limited uh, situations, but I've done a couple jobs near, I mean, literally right across the street from the helipad. Um, so I reached out to um, the uh, flight nurse um, there and I said, hey, you know, if you, here's my here's my VO's phone number. If you've got incoming, you call us, we'll put the bird on the deck, no problem. 
Yep. Talk. I mean, so, that's a really good point. Talk to people, you know, let them know that you're going to operate. Don't try to just operate in your corner. Uh, try to let them know what's going mm -hmm. on. I had a student who actually lives in Prescott uh, near me and, uh, and we have the same issue. We have a helipad in one of the spots and, um, and he did the same thing. He contacts them before he goes flying and he doesn't have to, but he does it and then just basically uh, contacts them and then gets information and that works really well. So yeah, talk to other people. Isn't a, a, it's a, funny, a, we're sitting here talking about that and my office is in my basement. I got a helicopter flying. Right <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Tom is asking, is there a listing available of existing friars? There's no friars at the moment. They haven't been approved, not for another 18 months. So once they are, though, they will be available on the FA website. My guess is they also will be available on the UAS facility map. Uh, or the I call it website. I call it the U.S. facility map, but somebody from the FAA told me that I shouldn't call it that because that's not the only information there. But I don't have a better word for it, so <laughs> I just call it the FAA ArcGIS map. Oh yeah, the ArcGIS map. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, blah, blah, let me see. All drones. We're we're gonna wrap it up pretty soon. Another five ten minutes here, and then whatever questions are left, I'm gonna keep them, and then Vic and uh, Kenji are gonna come back. And, uh, and then answer more questions next week. So I'll, I'll have that available on Wednesday morning uh, for you guys, and then we'll, uh, Wednesday early afternoon, and then we'll, uh, we'll have more questions in there. We'll bring Brandon from DJI, we'll drag him in and ask, answer <laughs> <laughs> DJI questions. Um, here, let's see, if you need a module, can you use it for all? Oh yeah, oh, that's a good question right there. If you need a module, can you use it for all drones flying under part 107, and what about uh, and what, what about not? I don't know. Uh, clarifying how many modules you will need. So I, I kind of touched on this in my video from Friday. Um, if you're flying, let, let's, let's do it flying under part 107 and flying as a recreational pilot because the answer is different. Under part 107, the certificate of registration, which is the, the registration certificate. I'm, I'm surprised the FA calls it certificate of registration because every other place in the regulation they call it registration certificate. But anyway, uh, the certificate of registration, you're going to have to tell the FA that you have a specific module attached to a specific drone. So my Inspire 2, I'm going to have to tell them that Inspire 2 is associated with module XXXX with the serial number. You cannot use the same module under part 107 with another drone. So in this case, you're going to have to get another module if you want to fly that drone for part 107 purposes and then add it to the certificate of registration for that drone. Each drone is going to have a separate uh, registration certificate of registration. If you're flying as, and then if I say something wrong, Vic, stop me. If you're flying as a... I've heard different, but keep going. Okay, well, I'll, and then, well, okay. And then as a 44809, you are going to have one certificate of registration because it's one per person. And then you will be able to attach all of the modules that you have. And then you will be able to basically remove the modules and put them to each drone that you want because it will be attached to that specific certificate, which kind of makes sense to me. So tell me what you've heard that's different. We'll get confirmation from Kevin on this before Wednesday. So come back, little teaser. Um, but what I'm understanding is I could buy, you know, for all my retrofit, um, legacy drones, I could buy one module and that can then um, put uh, another drone because each each registration is tied to a number on the, on the uh, RID module, but that module, I believe, can be used on other drones because you're not going to be flying more than one drone at a time. Yeah, but but we'll get confirmation on that. You so, might be right, um, I might be right, but I believe it's going to be the same no matter uh, recreational or 107. So there was, uh, yeah, here, actually, I wrote it down and then I said, no moving modules underneath it. So it says... Oh, really? Okay. Well, that, that, that was my comment from reading this. This is on page oh. 303 uh, in here. It says, for unmanned aircraft registered individually and operated under part 91, part 107, part 135, uh, the FA clarifies that the serial number used to register a standard remote ID unmanned aircraft or a remote ID broadcast module may only be associated with one registration application. Oh, okay. Well, okay, that makes sense then. So that you are probably right. Okay, let's get confirmation on that. Yeah, because to, to me, the way that I understand it is that that certificate of registration, because it's, it has to be done for each drone individually, 
Mm -hmm. the, the remote ID module now becomes, and then it also says in here, it says this means that a person may not move the remote ID broadcast module amongst aircraft required to be registered individually without removing the serial number from one certificate of registration, which can be done, but it would cost you $5 every time because you'd have every to flip, flip flopping the stuff. So page 303 is where it's at. Okay, cool. Uh, if you, I'll uh, open if mine you on the back, back so it's page numbers are a mess. Oh, um, yeah. Well, even even if it is doable, like you're like I'm saying, which it sounds like it's not based on what you just read, um, I plan on any any legacy drone I have, or my tiny whoops, or um, um, Cindy whoops, I'm going to have its own module anyway just to make my life easier. Yep. But for me, it's a business expense, it's not a hobby expense, so I can you know I can justify it a lot better. Yeah, I agree. And well, I mean, we don't have a, a price really right now for the cost, but uh, I don't get some twenty-five. That's just yeah, educated guess. I'm going to do more research because I know in Europe they're selling them. So whatever the price is in Europe, probably 10, 20 percent less here because of taxes and all that stuff. So, yeah, um, yeah. Um, Mar Marty had a good one. Marty is one of our students. 400 feet or, or not, drones still have to give way to all my aircraft. Absolutely. Bingo. 100%. Yep, exactly. Um, OK, uh, let's do a couple more and then we'll stop. Have you or will you post a link to the published new laws? Yes, they are available. Uh, in the video I posted on Friday, I'll put them in here as well, so you can see the uh, 700 or 800 we have pages. We as well. Yeah, and then yeah, on the, on, the, on Vic's website on the D, DSP DSPAlliance.org. DSP DSPAlliance.org. Thank you. Um, how would someone reading this that has it? Oh, hold on. No. Do you think? Do you think that the AirMap interface will change? Well, AirMap. I don't care for air map, so uh, air map or um, or Kitty Hawk okay. or whatever. Uh, I don't know that they will really change much. I don't see a need for it, other than showing you where the Fryas are going to be located, right? But yeah, I, don't... Uh, I would imagine they would. Uh, but since RID is not tied to Lance, uh, I just really don't see it being an issue. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll, we'll finish with JET. Uh, how will Remote ID in its current form address issues for BV loss? The FA keeps. Oh no, that, we we answered that one already. Um, somebody says, "Hey Vic." So that's a, when you came on board. That's how far we are in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, oh, this is a good one actually. We'll finish with this as a discussion, and then uh, I'll I'll do the rest of the questions in here. Uh, how about uh, something getting hacked? Now, not only the database getting hacked, but um, you know, somebody hacking the software so that they can fly with Mode ID. Uh, it's supposed to be tamper proof, but we know that uh, bright minds are out there. Um, tamper resistant is the word. Oh, tamper resistant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing as tamper proof. We all know that. Uh, you know, half the seventh graders out there can probably hack it already. Yeah, well, and, so, um, yeah, we don't want to give tips, but obviously there are things, there are things you're going to be able to do to block the GPS signal and mm -hmm. all of that, so, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I'm going to... The will be hacked at some point, but uh, that's, that's just, just the nature, nature of, of, of the world yeah. now. And I don't really see, quite frankly, I don't see a need for it because mm -hmm. I, I know you were worried too, and, and I was really worried about what they were going to come up with. And, um, and they, they listen. I mean, I'm really pleased to see that the FA actually listened to all these okay. comments. So this is fairly reasonable, except for a few things that um, I have issues with, but mostly I think this is a pretty good... Think so. Um, it's a we'll, good start, is what we call it on our blog. Yeah, yeah, it's a good start. I mean, in, in title. Yeah, no, exactly, absolutely. So, yeah, I'll stop right here. We've been going for two hours now. Uh, thank you for all wow. the questions. You guys are awesome. I don't know how many questions we answered, but there was a ton. Um, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna go through the rest of the questions. So keep putting them in here. I'm gonna make a summary of of the good ones, and then we'll come back next week on Wednesday with Vic and then with Kenji, and Kenji has, uh, has more insights also because he's involved with the standards, so he has a bit more of a technical aspect of things uh, than, uh, than I don't have. I know Vic is, talks with him a lot as well, so uh, we'll be able to answer more of these questions, and I just want to thank you guys for your time. Vic, thank you for joining in after your, uh, your you thing this morning. Yeah. And then, uh, You'll have and then some great questions. Keep it up. Yep. Yeah. And so we'll keep keep educating people. If you see people that are answering the questions incorrectly, you know the best way that I found to answer people when when you think something is incorrect, go back to the regulation, find the page that the stuff is on, and then tell them I don't think this is correct because of this. And then here's the information. You can't go against 
the regulation in itself. So um, let's get the word out so that this is not confusing, so that we don't have uh, false information like I've seen a lot, and um, and then we'll go from there. So, Vic, have a great I think Sunday. For, for, for what? For printing out the, for printing out the final rule. Oh, uh, I, I read better on paper because I can I can flip flop between all different things because you know I put like a bunch of tabs right here in the corner and I can go to each of the different sections but and, and especially the regulation because you know the regulation is really the big part of it but it's at the end so you have to keep going back and forth so I like the, the printed better so I killed a tree doing it but um, I'm gonna keep doing this we're using it for a while all right well have a great Sunday all and then uh, we'll see you guys hopefully on uh, on Wednesday Bye, safe. all right Thanks. Thanks, Thanks bye. -bye. bye, -bye.